Canes traders, and welcome back. Thank you for joining me again, as always. Chris here, bringing you another survival guide. Today's subject will be aggregate demand. We're going to talk about exactly what aggregate demand is, as well as work our way into the aggregate demand curve, and we'll talk about the factors that influence the shifts in that particular curve. This is one of those fundamentally driven aspects, so it's not going to be indicator-based, but that doesn't mean that this information can't potentially help you as you are attempting to pass the Gauntlet Mini. So make sure you pay attention, take some notes, and enjoy the ride, but without further ado, let's get Get going. At one point or another, you may have heard of aggregate demand or aggregate demand curve, but maybe didn't have the willpower to dive deeper by yourself. Well, today I'm going to make it easy on you. I'm going to sum up exactly what aggregate demand and the aggregate demand curve is. That way you have what you need to know and you don't have to put in all of that tedious work on your own. And the reason is I feel that those who haven't actually looked at an aggregate demand curve might assume that it's just simply a straight line. I find that many traders believe that as the average price comes down, the demand increases. This assumes a whole array of different factors will remain constant, which in reality, they don't. It, things such as consumer spending, private investments, government spending, exports, and a variety of other things that we're going to cover all are things that need to be taken into consideration when analyzing these types of scenarios. And any well-rounded trader should be aware of these type of fundamentals as well. So, first things first. What is aggregate demand? The definition of aggregate demand is relatively simple to understand. It's an economic measurement that reflects total demand for all finished goods and services produced in an economy and listed in local currency. There is a direct correlation between aggregate demand and gross domestic product, even though they are not the exact same thing. The gross domestic product reflects the total amount of goods and services produced in an economy and the local currency, but adjusted for inflation. Changes in interest rates, consumer demand, and other factors will shift the curve to the left or to the right. There is an ongoing argument amongst economists as to whether an increase in consumer demand prompts an increase in production. It could also be that an increase in production prompts an increase in demand. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? That's the idea here. To better understand the aggregate demand, we should talk about the impacting factors behind it. And contrary to popular belief, changes in the aggregate demand are not caused by the change in the price of individual products or services. It's actually more of a shift in economic activity. An example of this is in recessionary times, we tend to see a reduction in consumer spending. It's also accompanied by an increase in savings and a reduction in debt levels. This prompts a downward shift in the aggregate demand curve. And as a consequence, demand for products and services will fall. In response, the need to save costs can potentially lead to large numbers of layoffs. And large-scale unemployment can prompt another fall in consumer demand, creating something of a vicious cycle. And this is why we tend to see an increase in government spending and tax breaks in recessionary time. It's meant to compensate for the reduction in other determinants of aggregate demand. We're seeing a lot of this go on right now with the coronavirus with various things that the government has been employing. In buoyant economies, there is reduced requirement for government investment. Tax breaks and growing wages feed into growing consumer demand, as well as an upshift in general demand for goods and services. Growing demand for goods and services tends to result in specific upward pricing pressure. A growing economy often leads to higher average wage increases. When that happens, it prompts an increase in overall business costs. The resulting higher inflation puts further upward pressure on elements such as material costs. And as we mentioned, there's often a lag between the increase in the cost of goods and services to consumers and the cost of business itself. It can be tempting to directly associate a graph showing the aggregate demand curve with a simple supply-demand formula 
for an individual product or service. But in this scenario, the assumption is that the price of all goods and services remains constant as does the income and expenditure of consumers. When looking at an aggregate demand curve, it is various determinants that we need to take into account with a whole range of factors. If, for example, we look at interest rates, they can have a huge impact on business costs and consumer demand. If interest rates increase, then this will push the cost of business borrowing and consumer loans higher naturally, which prompts a reduced demand. A reduction in interest rates will have the opposite effect. It reduces the cost of borrowing encouraging business investment and boosting overall consumer demand. There is an undeniable correlation between changes in interest rates and the cost of business borrowing with consumer credit. It is worth noting that speculation is also heavily factored into influencing this demand. If, for example, a buoyant economy has many consumers and businesses, assuming that the strength of that economy is going to continue forward, they may continue to encourage it to go forward. Determining prices based on that premise could result in higher costs of goods for both businesses and the consumers. This may impact the short-term demand, which could then in turn lead to a rise in the aggregate demand. Conversely, when when we look at what we're experiencing now in light of the coronavirus pandemic, there could be an assumption that the economic activity would reduce and prices will fall in real terms. This scenario would prompt a reduction in aggregate demand and shift the curve to the left. Aside from interest rates and inflation like we mentioned, there are other leading factors that impact aggregate demand as well as the aggregate demand curve. So we're going to go over exactly what those are. The first one is the household wealth. With household wealth, this means that when we're looking at economic data, we can come across the average household wealth and disposable income. And when we do this, an increase in the household wealth, when we pay attention to that, it generally has a positive impact on aggregate demand. This is mainly because of greater confidence in the economy, high levels of disposable income, and more willingness to take on consumer debt. When the household wealth declines, we will then experience a reduction in consumer debt. And this is due to an increase in consumer savings and a delay slash post moment in acquiring certain types of goods and services. This has a detrimental impact on the aggregate demand curve on the opposite side of the coin. Then we have the government expenditure. You will notice that governments tend to inject greater levels of capital into the economy in more challenging times like now. This could take the shape of increased investment in housing, reduction in business rates, or even income tax. The idea is simple. When you reduce living expenses or business costs, you help build consumer disposable income. Doing so reduces the downward impact on aggregate demand. Consequently, in more buoyant economic times, the government tends to refrain from tax giveaways and huge consumer investments. The reason being, it could create an overheating economy and a consumer bubble that may be ready to burst. Then we have foreign exchange rates. Currencies very rarely move in the same direction, and as a consequence, the cost of goods to foreign buyers tends to be fairly volatile across different settings. The formula for calculating aggregate demand does take net exports into account. Therefore, changes in the value of foreign exchange currencies themselves can have an impact on the aggregate demand curve. If, for example, the British pound is weakening against the US dollar, then US consumers would be more attracted to UK imports. And on the flip side, if the pound is strengthening against the US dollar, that would make US imports more attractive to UK buyers. And finally, we have cost of materials. Moving on from the currency exchange rates, let's talk about the imports themselves. Many businesses rely on the imports of materials or even employees to be able to provide those products and services that they need to for their business. For example, the cost of oil is traditionally quoted in US dollars. Therefore, any movement in the pound dollar exchange rate would have an impact on the base business costs in both countries. We also need to take into account the fact that some materials may become scarce in times of heightened demand. On a purely supply demand basis, this can often lead to an increase in the cost of materials. Using a graph, we can take a look at exactly what the curve looks like. And we're also going to switch over to this image here. That way you can look back and forth between a regular curve and how the curve works. 
shifts. So with this image here, with this graph, we can see that the curve is skewed towards an increase in aggregate demand as price levels fall. However, it's not a straight line. The impact certain factors have, such as interest rate changes, can distort the curve. This also doesn't show any up or downward shifts in the curves. Now, as we switch over to what causes the graph to shift, we can see exactly what an upshift in economic activity would do to the graph expanding the curve outward. The formula that we use to calculate the aggregate demand is based on an economic model that was presented by Robert Mundell and Marcus Fleming, and here it sits. This is a very simple formula to follow because it is literally all addition. Now, it's commonly referred to as the Mundell-Fleming model. There is a much more complex formula, which involves the individual calculations for the C, I, G, as well as the NX. But in this situation, our aggregate demand is going to be our AD, and this is equal to our C plus our I plus our G plus our NX. And our C is our consumer spending. Our I is going to be our business investment spending on non-final capital goods. Our G is going to be our government investment expenditure on public goods and social services. And our NX is just going to be equal to our net exports. Now for some frequently asked questions, so maybe I can save you a trip to the old Google machine. Number one is going to be how can government policies shift the aggregate demand curve to the right? Well, the, there's numerous ways in which government policies can shift the aggregate demand curve to the right, and those include maintaining relatively low interest rates or reducing tax burden or working towards full-time employment and encouraging exports. There's a ton of different ways, but those are some of the most common. Full employment equates to more disposable income, while low interest and tax rates ensure that consumers retain a larger share of their income and business costs remain relatively low. Historically, interest rates have been used as the tool of choice by many central banks and governments, although disinvestment and investment strategies in the economy can also have a similar impact. Number two is going to be why does aggregate demand slope downward? Many people might automatically assume that the aggregate demand curve should be a straight line, but this would assume that all determinants remain constant like we said. This is not always the case. Even if the determinants were to move in the same direction, they wouldn't necessarily move at the same rate. There's also the added impact of imports and exports and the lag between the increase in demand and the increase in production cost. So when you you look at it from a distance, the aggregate demand downward slope reflects the actual situation as opposed to the theoretical situation. And for number three, which combination of factors would most likely increase aggregate demand? Well, the basic idea is that any factor which would increase consumer spending would also lead to an increase in aggregate demand. And some of the more influential factors are the relatively low interest rate ideas or reducing borrowing costs for businesses and consumers or a reduction in direct taxes like income tax. The impact of these factors would depend on the impact of other factors which could reduce disposable income or induce a degree of concern amongst consumers. It's also worth remembering that changing the direction of aggregate demand is not something that happens overnight. We have seen some brief and sharp shifts that occurred, such as the housing market collapse around 2009, but the 2020 coronavirus pandemic that we're currently experiencing is already causing a sharp shift as well. But once again, this is something that is generally not the case. These things usually take time. So in conclusion, aggregate supply as well as the aggregate supply curve is a very useful piece of information for anybody looking to do fundamental analysis and trading over the long term. It's different than regular supply and demand due to the fact that it has a dynamic range of different variables that are all moving at different rates. So when someone considers it the same as a supply and demand chart, that's really a strong oversimplification. But other than that, when you're trading the gauntlet mini, you might find that technical analysis 
this may be what you're favoring in the short term, but the idea of the gauntlet is to come out a successful trader and remain a successful trader for the long term. So this knowledge is crucial in the long term. I thank you for joining me as always, folks. I hope you have a good rest of your day and good luck in the markets. Please make sure you hit that subscribe and like button down below because it helps me out a great deal. Best of luck, everybody. Over and out. Bzzz.